Hey guys, so this is our third video in the series of data representation. Uh, if you've already had the lessons with me, there'll be a good recap for you, particularly if you're doing some revision on the lead up to your exam. So we're talking about data representation and today we're gonna look at characters and images, how our computers actually display text and images on our screen. Now, uh, if you have a look at this image here, uh, what you can see is all the ones, okay, represent uh, the black and all the zeros represent when it's turned off. Now you could argue that's, that's different, but the point that I'm trying to show to you is that images are represented through through binary. Uh, they are shown uh, through a series of binary codes which are then converted onto our screen and this is what a simple binary image might look like uh, with our ones and our zeros and we're going to delve a little deeper into that over the course of these next couple of slides because images don't just show on the screen there's a lot of science behind how they appear there. Now I want you to have a look at this. What does this say? Now, all I will say to you is in order to do this activity, you will need to know what number 32 is in ASCII. Um, I usually give this activity sheet to my students and get them to figure out what the message actually says. Uh, what you will need to do is find out the value of each of these in Deanery and then match up the letter using an ASCII table and you can find them on the internet. Um, but it's a good activity to kind of get you to start understanding how text is displayed on a computer system. And we're moving on. So what you're gonna learn about today is how to represent characters and images. Now, what you will need to know about in the exam is how computers represent characters. First of all, you need to know what a character set is. Now, a character set are the, the letters and numbers available to the computer system. So uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on. It's the letters that are available. Now, these three key points here are what you will need to know for the exam syllabus. You'll need to know what is happening. Now, when you press a key on your keyboard, a, a binary code is generated, okay? Now that binary code can represent any number between one and 127. And you can get a number of different characters available. Now, when that number is converted from binary into the ASCII number system, um, it will generate a letter for you. So the character means the number of characters available, sorry, the character set. And when you type in, a number on or letter on your keyboard, a binary code is generated and the computer uses the ASCII to translate that. Now, there, this is, you, you need to know that there are 127 characters available in ASCII. Now, what you, although it only uses the seven bits, it tends to use the last bit for checking for errors. So what I would get into the habit of answering this exam question, like if, if it says how many characters are available to ASCII, there's 127. How many bits are used? Do you want to try and stick to saying a byte? This is just so you can kind of see how it works, but the ASCII system uses 52 characters. So that's all your uppercase and lowercase. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. But then you have the capital letters as well. ASCII also represents your numbers. So you've got zero to nine. You've also got your punctuation, your space, uh, and then there are control codes. So like when you uh, say, for example, you, you want to print something or a, a keyboard shortcut, all of those control codes are also within ASCII, which gives you 127 possible characters available. Now, problem is back in the day, all right, or years and years and years ago, uh, computers were only able to work with eight bits, which meant you could only get um, 128 characters in ASCII, okay? This was a problem. Now, because of this, they had to develop computers further, and that is where they started using something called Unicode. Now, Unicode allows a greater number of characters available, because uh, you can have a look here. This is just a basic system using A, B, C, D, 
uh, A, B, and Z, and you can see what the deanery value is, and you can see we don't go any higher than 127. All right. Now, just so you're aware, uppercase characters always come first. So if you had to sort in order uh, the word zebra and apple, actually zebra would come first because of the capital Z. So bear that in mind in case you get an exam question. But let's go back to the problem that we have. The problem with just having ASCII is that you could only represent a, a small number of characters. You could only do 128 characters. What happens when you want to use accents or what happens when different languages came into play? We needed something bigger. We needed a bigger character set, which is why we went on to something called Unicode. Now, Unicode was developed between 16-bit and 32-bit because there are different numbers of systems. And I dare say, with the uh, different computer systems increasing over time now, there will be even more characters available. But because of that, we can now use different codes, different accents, and we are able to get a larger number of characters available. So if you have to explain the difference between the two in your exam question, you need to make sure that you say that ASCII has a lower number of characters available, whereas ASCII Unicode has a higher number. And you also need to be able to explain how many bytes are used, because in ASCII, we only use a single byte, 8 bits, whereas in Unicode, we can go between 2 bytes and 4 bytes. So you need to actually be able to recognize that in your exam. Now, moving forward, uh, I, in my lesson, gave you some worksheets here. So you may want to go back into your folders and have a look at those and attempt those again, just to improve your understanding of how and why we use ASCII. Now, representing images is very, very different. So what you can see here is we've got our blank grid and we've got our ones in binary, okay? And this is just how an image might look uh, represented in binary. And this is how computers represent images. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this now. Now, in reality, images aren't just made up of ones and zeros anymore. It's not simple black and white. We have a lot more that we have to contend with, which means we've got a lot more colors. We've got like a pigment that we have to think about. And this is why we started using hexadecimal, if you think back to our previous, previous uh, presentation. Hexadecimal allows us to actually represent bigger numbers just using letters that are more memorable. But in reality, images are a lot more complex today. We've got uh, our reds, our greens, our blues, all of these different colors that we have to think about. So thinking about it, if you have a one bit image, there are two colors for each pixel. So that's two possible colors. Now, if you have two bits, there are four possible colors available. Three bits, we have eight possible colors available. And you can see how this is increasing because what we're doing is we're going to the power of two in order to work this out. Uh, and that is how you work out the range of colors available. So think about it. If I've got one, one to the power of two, it's going to give me two possible outcomes and so on and so on. And you can see if you use it, even if you don't have a calculator, you can work this out by doing uh, two times two times two times two times two and so on uh, until you've got the number of bits that you've used. So some of the key points that you need to be aware of for your exam are you need to know that the number of bits used in a pixel is called your color depth or your bit depth. So the number of colors available, all right, is your color depth or your bit depth. The greater the color depth, the greater number of colors that you will be able to represent. So if I've got 16 16 bits, I'm going to have a high color. But if I go up to 32 bits, I'm going to have even more colors available. So you may have to answer the exam and say, what happens if I've got 16 bits and 32 bits? What's the difference going to be in the color? Well, you can say with 32 bits, you're going to be able to represent a lot more colors, which is going to give you deep color. And you can also say that it's also going to have an increase on the file size because if you have more bits used, okay, that's that. Think about it. If I've got 32 bits, 
Think about how many bytes of information I've used compared to 16 bits. You need to recognize that the more bits you use, the greater your file size is going to be. And that is usually a mark within this question. Now, your resolution is known as the number of pixels per unit or number of bits used or the concentration of pixels. And pixels per inch is dots per inch. And the more dots per inch you have is the larger the file. So you need to be able to remember that and be able to actually just reel that off your tongue in an exam situation. Now, estimating the file size uh, can be quite difficult. And this is mainly in the old spec because they are allowed the calculator in this. But what you need to know is in order to get the file size, you can do height times width times color depth. That will give you the amount of pixels. Now, what you need to be able to do then, once you've worked out the bits, is if you want to work out how many bytes that fits into, remember, we have eight bits to a byte. So all you do is divide that by eight, and then to get it into megabytes, you divide it by one million. Now, if I needed to make that even smaller again, okay, I would need to divide that again. So that is how you estimate the file size in megabytes. So the approximate size there was 6.3 megabytes. What you need to know as well is that there are certain compression types that you can use. Like if you save it as a JPEG, you're going to reduce the size of an image, all right? Remember image file types because there are many students in their exams that still keep making the mistake of putting the wrong file type. Uh, a GIF image, a, a JPEG image, and a BMP image. You've also got a PNG. They are all types of images. Keep away from anything to do with a PDF because that is what is used for business documents or things that have been scanned in. So don't get those mixed up. All right. Remember, when we use JPEGs, images with large areas of same color, the patterns repeated so that it's compressed even more. All right. And remember, to begin with, the way an image is made up as a bitmap is that each pixel has a has key information inside it. All right. This key information can include the color depth, the resolution, geotags. Now, I want you to have a look at this here. This is a this is an image. Now, images don't just include with within that binary information. It doesn't just include uh, the color. There are there's other pieces of information inside it, and that's called metadata. Metadata are is the kind of hidden information that you don't see in your picture. And if you right click on an image, you can see some of the properties of this, such as your resolution, your width, your height your bit depth, uh, the camera make and model is used, uh, your geotag where the picture was taken. Uh, so you need to be aware of this in your exam. Now, have a think about these questions and then go back through this presentation and see how you get on with them. But use these questions as some revision and look back over your notes to see if you've got it right. I hope that there's some key points there that can help you recap on what we've talked about in the lesson. I have compressed down a whole lesson into 14 minutes, but I hope that's been useful for you. Thank you for watching.